Hello, yes, uh, we thought we'd be begin on time. Nothing ever does at the Frontline Club, really. Uh, so we'll also end on time. And um, it's my proposal to run it as a public meeting. So there won't be discussion at the end, there'll be discussion all the way through. Uh, which uh, I've sat in an audience and it can be very difficult to, to keep things to the end. So please, if you'd like, uh, when I open it up, which is very soon, do uh, get involved. So the topic that you've kindly come uh, for tonight is an idea that there's a power behind the throne in the United States. Um, and I will get to the topic in a second. Could you each of you give us a one minute pen portrait, introduce <coughs> yourselves to the audience, starting uh, nearest to me with Michael Goldfarb. Oh, okay. I, my name's Michael Goldfarb. I'm currently the London correspondent for globalpost.com, which is a new news website which was started a year and a half ago by, so, by the many foreign correspondents who've been laid off in the great cull of American journalism, which is contrived to make ignorance even deeper in, in the land of my native birth. Uh, before that, I worked for National Public Radio and other public radio stations, and I covered, over a period of about 20 years, culture, but also conflict and conflict resolution from Belfast to Bosnia to Baghdad. And I'm the author of the book, Ahmed's War, Ahmed's Peace, Surviving Under Saddam, Dying in the New Iraq. Russ? Uh, I'm Russ Baker. Uh, this is my book here, Family of Secrets. Uh, I hail from New York. Uh, and uh, I tend to come to England whenever I can't get my things published in the United States, which has happened many times throughout the two decades I've been an investigative journalist. However, paradoxically, my book was published only in the United States by a British company, so figure that one out. Um, I uh, report on abuses of power. I've written for a broad range of publications, the United States, uh, major and minor ones, uh, as well as uh, British publications from left to right and on the continent as well. I'm Godfrey Hodgson. I <coughs> was the Observer's uh, Washington correspondent in the 1960s. I, uh, <coughs> the smartest thing I ever did was to get myself a desk in the Washington Post newsroom, where I spent a great deal of many years. Um, I um, worked subsequently for the Sunday Times as the editor of Insight. Uh, I was later, I worked in television a lot. I, I was the foreign editor of The Independent. Uh, in its palmy days, and then I spent eight and a half years running a program for journalists at Oxford University. I'm now retired, and I've written, I think it's 11 or 12 books about American politics. Thank you all very much. And um, do, do give us an introduction to yourself later on, if you wish, when you, when you come to raise questions. Um, so, what are the forces in play within the American political system? To what extent does their power and influence go beyond the presidency? Now, uh, after five years, Russ Baker published this book. Uh, in five minutes, <laughs> Russ Baker, uh, give us your headlines. Uh, a rethought, new thinking on Watergate, new thinking on the assassination. And also, you basically say to Obama, no, you can't. So tell us why, and uh, we'll open it up, and then we'll hear from our other panelists in the same way. All right, basically, every story I do, I do it the same way. I start not knowing what I'm going to find, which I think is a prerequisite of good journalism. Uh, and about uh, five years ago, I simply wondered, what was George W. Bush? What was this about? Uh, I don't think I need to recite all the ways in which the world, including your world, has changed fundamentally as a result of this man. Uh, in his administration. And so I simply wondered, uh, was there not more to the story, more to who he was, who was behind him, and why he did the things that he did? Um, and uh, so I began traveling the United States uh, in 2004. By the way, just backing up a little further, in 2002, 2003, <laughs> I was in the former Yugoslavia training journalists over there about the importance of investigative reporting uh, in a democratic society. And when the uh, Iraq invasion began, and it was very clear to me, and I was writing articles at the time that the whole thing was trumped up, uh, people began asking me, well, why aren't you at home uh, doing the same reporting back there? And I thought, you know, I better do that. So in 2004, with Bush uh, on his way to re-election, 
went back and I began studying him. Uh, one of the first things I found was that, in fact, it was pretty clear that he had, in fact, been a deserter uh, during the Vietnam War. And I was so staggered that the President of the United States, who had launched a, an elective war, could be a deserter in another war and that this could not be resolved to anyone's satisfaction. So I did some work on that. I published some articles in The Nation magazine online about this. Uh, and then I met uh, George Bush's ghostwriter, Mickey Herskowitz, who I write about in Family of Secrets. Uh, and Mickey told me uh, uh, the reason uh, that in 1999, years before uh, uh, September 11, George W. Bush, working with him on a book, told him that if he was elected president of the United States, the only thing he could think of that he really wanted to do was to invade Iraq. And in there, I provide the reasons. We can talk more about that later if you like. In any case, uh, it soon be became clear to me uh, that uh, Bush's father had been instrumental in covering up as being a deserter, and so I became more interested in the father because, as you all know, they've tried to sell us the story that there was this Oedipal complex, that the father and son uh, were always rivals and very, very different, and that the father disapproved of what the son did in office. The more I studied them, the more I found that they were actually joined at the hip, and that to understand the son, you actually had to understand the father. I then went back and started collecting books, and I assembled a library of more than 500 books, uh, a well-known and obscure uh, on the Bushes and on people uh, with whom they'd interacted over the decades. Became interested in the father, became interested in the grandfather, a man named Senator Prescott Bush. Uh, and after about two years of research, I started <coughs> uncovering revelations that just absolutely astonished me and began transforming my sense of how history even worked. Uh, and uh, you can't really see it, but if you get a chance later, look in the photo gallery in the book. There is a picture of uh, Richard Nixon, Vice President Richard Nixon, standing with a taller man. They're both wearing Panama hats. Uh, uh, very clearly, the, the taller man is in command. <coughs> if you look at this, I think everybody will agree with that. The taller man is toying with Nixon's hat, and Nixon looks sort of embarrassed. At the time, Nixon was the vice president of the United States. The other man was Senator Prescott Bush, the grandfather of George W. And that picture, as they say, it was worth a 1,000 words, which I'll try to do in about 20. Basically, what I discovered was that uh, there was a secret history to how George W. George H. W. Bush, I call him Poppy, which is his family nickname in the book, how Poppy Bush uh, became president of the United States, and this explains how his son became president. Basically, the father had a secret life. The father was not only, as we all know, the CIA director for a single year, brought in as a fresh face to clean it up. In fact, what he was was a deep cover intelligence officer himself his entire adult life. That's one of the many revelations of Family of Secrets. Um, his companies were cover for moving oil rigs off of the uh, Bay of Pigs and so forth. In any case, uh, once I began looking at that, I had to look at everything. How did he get to the top? Why did Nixon sponsor him? And what I discovered was that the Bush family basically owned Richard Nixon since 1946. This was the real story of how he had been created as a political figure in order to knock out a congressman who was investigating banking interests in the 1940s. Uh, again, this is all new because it's simply not in any other book. In any case, once I discovered that, I began looking at what H.W. Bush did during Watergate. I found uh, when he was a Republican chairman that there actually was a con installation of CIA figures, including himself, who appeared to be determined to drive Richard Nixon from office. This was not from the left, this was from the right. Uh, and I became convinced through evidence that I uncovered that, in fact, the entire Watergate story is wrong, that, in fact, it was a frame-up job against Nixon to push him uh, and, uh, to some extent, Kissinger uh, out of the driver's seat by uh, the Pentagon, the intelligence agencies, oil companies, uh, defense contractors, and so forth. Go a lot more into it if you like. Okay. Yeah. Pause there for a second. There's an awful lot yeah. just given us. <laughs> and uh, naturally, the man on the panel speaking to us has, uh, for, the, for, for these opinions, been attacked, and the, much of this has been dismissed uh, by the people who support Bush. But the book itself has taken five years of research, and there's a great deal of notes in it. O on the general question, do you believe there are powers behind the throne beyond the Bushes? Because if the question that's brought people into the room is about beyond the presidency, you've spoken to us about right. Nixon, about right. Bushes. Without being long, are there powers behind the throne going back the whole of the 20th century, for instance? Yes. And in fact, I would also say, uh, I would say that those powers are a shifting group of people. It's not a five people in an eyes wide shut type scenario. Uh, it's a shifting group of people. You might call it the American upper class. Uh, they fight with each other. They do bad things with each other. But they very much get together from time to time. And there's a certain consensus on what is and is not permissible. And I believe this is explained by the fact that when you remove a conservative Republican and you put in a purportedly liberal Democrat, you see that the, mo the range of possibility is 
incredibly, incredibly narrow. So Obama, what kind of a liberal reforming president has he been so far? That is very complicated, and that depends on what you look at. I mean, on, on some things in terms of regulation and the basic function of government, he's been a great reformer. He really has actually brought in people who think that their job is to do what the name on the department says. And so that is a major reform. So he brought in people you know, in the, the department handling the environment who actually think that the job is to protect the environment instead of to just help out their cronies uh, at the chemical company. So yes, in many areas, I think he has made changes. But on the big issues of uh, War and peace, uh, and who controls the economy? No. Thank you. It's five years of your life. Thank you for condensing it for us. Um, <laughs> Godfrey Hodgson, uh, you've got to do the same for 50 years of your life. Yeah. Uh, five minutes. Well, Are there powers behind the throne, and what's the evidence for it? Well, I don't think there's a single conspiracy. I never have thought that. I don't think it's feasible. What, what is true, I think, is that America is has always been, or has for a long time been, a class society. It, this is passionately denied. I mean, when I first met Americans as a student at Oxford, the first thing they would do over the first beer was say, you, do you realize we don't have class in our country? But the more, and I, I, it so happens that I've, a lot of my work has been about that. I, I wrote a, the pioneer article about the American foreign policy establishment, which is about investment bankers and their lawyers on Wall Street, essentially and the academics at certain very expensive uniform universities who, who go along with their view of the world. I've also written a couple of biographies of people who are within that uh, world, including an interesting man called Colonel Edward House, who was Woodrow Wilson's uh, right-hand man. Um, and I tell you that there are, <coughs> there are groups with very great power, essentially a commercial aristocracy, who disagree, as, as you said, they fight among themselves from time to time. But when their essential position is threatened, they defend themselves often with considerable ferocity. Now, don't uh, pause there. For instance, Obama, does he look to you like a powerful man? Well, of course he's a powerful man because the presidency of the United States is, at least in theory, a powerful office. It's not in many, most of the people who have actually held that office have gone out of their way to say how surprised they were to find how little power they have. Even Franklin Roosevelt complained that compared to the US Navy, he could never get the Navy to do what he wanted them to do. Uh, he said it was like punching a pillow. And uh, this ruling by, by, by the way, I'm sorry, I just, just, if I might just supplement what he said, because he mentioned Colonel House. In fact, there's a letter I quote in the book where Franklin Roosevelt writes to Colonel House shortly after assuming office, and he says, you and I both know that the real power in this country uh, resides on Wall Street. Yeah. But uh, does that mean that, just to, just to ask you about Obama, he's not part of this ruling class. Is this ruling class a business elite, and Obama's basically tinkering at the margins? Well, he... He belongs to it in the sense that anybody who went to Eton belongs to the English upper class because he went to the Harvard Law School. And that is the central educational institution devoted to preserving the American upper class. M even more so than Yale, which is in some ways more blue-blooded. <coughs> okay, um, thank you. And to you, Michael Gofab, finally, would you like to address the topic tonight? Would you like to be reminded of it? <laughs> I think, I think I know what the topic is, and, and since we've only got, what, an hour, I, I don't know that we, we can all get around it. Um, let me just not address the topic, but address what's been said already. Um, one of the interesting things that I, I'm inclined as anybody else to see how the connections, particularly amongst the American aristocracy, work, because um, I had a privileged view as an adolescent. I'm, I'm Jewish. and. It, I was from the very first generation of Jews to grow up with wasps. And I, I, I grew up on the main line of Philadelphia and got to know intimately, both um, through trying to chase the same girls, because you know Jewish guys love the love shixes, and also through... You, what through, language are you speaking? So, and, and, well, because people here will understand because they all read Philip Roth. Um, the, you know, and, and also playing lacrosse, which is a very... Um, it's a kind of game that we call preppy that you would call a public schoolboy kind of game. I know exactly who these people are. 
Um, and I'm, I'm certainly aware of their proclivities for trying to control and fight their corner against what they no doubt have seen throughout the century as a rising tide of people not like us. Um, and I was thinking, listening to, to Godfrey talking about merchant bankers on Wall Street and, and, and Edward House, how horrified they must be in their graves that Lloyd Blankfein who is a Jewish guy, working class guy, from the projects in New York, runs Goldman Sachs, and to a considerable degree, affects all American Treasury policy at the moment. $550 million fine, one day's profits, for a massive fraud that was a contributory factor of the crash in 2007. My concern about, about over um, congratulating these people for their power is that my entire experience of the last 20 years working as a correspondent is that no one has any effective control over anything at the moment. There were certain very strong um, parameters during the Cold War, um, and you could be reasonably certain um, that one side and the other thought the same way, manipulated each other the same way to get advantage around the globe. That is no longer the case. And, and I'm actually, based on my experience last summer, reporting for the World Service on the attempt to pass a, a health bill, I am more than ever convinced that the ruling class has absolutely no control over anything, and that there's a mass, and that massively around the world, we are in a time of extreme chaos, which, and, and to ignore this um, in search of you know, some kind of framework for reality is actually quite dangerous. It needs to be thought through more thoroughly, I think. Now, hold on, hold on. So there we have a view that it, it, you know, there are people who are behind the throne, a view that the throne is, well, is not sitting on anything, it's all a disaster, uh, and uh, you know, a view that there's an upper class in the United States and they act in an old-fashioned way. So let's just hear some views from the audience, uh, which is you, uh, if you'd like to say what you think about the subject, and specifically what you've heard, if you'd like to agree or disagree. We've got a microphone. Does anyone want to start? Yes, please, coming up. Do, do, do just uh, say something uh, about yourself and then ask one of our panelists or the room. Hi, uh, Brian Saker, just, just a member of the public, really. A member? Um, did they let you in? <laughs> <laughs> Um, we've just got to the point where, for the first time ever in the U.S., there's not a single WASP uh, on the Supreme Court. Will you just explain um, what a WASP is and then right. move on? White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. So, John, John Roberts. Um, no, he's is not. he not? He's Catholic. Catholic, I think. Catholic, indeed. Yeah, they're, they're all either Catholic or Jewish, or in the case of one of them, black. So, doesn't that undermine the, the <laughs> argument that the WASPs are, are still very powerful? And who introduced the WASPs? You. Well, you, I... Actually, I, I was doing shorthand for what Godfrey said. Um, I'm reminded of something written by... Um, oh. You're not reminded of it, then. <laughs> no. In, in, you know, the guy who's always wrong in the Times. He doesn't write, for, doesn't write anymore. He's older. He's, Kaleski. But you, no, 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 no. He's a blue blood here. He's always his son, wrong. His son... His son <laughs> his, no, no, the London Times. His son, his son just got a, stood for Parliament. Come on. William Rees Mogg in 1986, 1988, wrote that the wasp was dead and that, because he's always wrong, and that um, Dukakis was going to beat George Herbert Walker Bush mm -hmm. in the presidency. So, yeah, there is, wasp power is, it's odd. I mean, it, it, I would have to say that it is in retreat. Not so much retreat, but it's been joined at the top table by a much larger and more diverse crew. Diversity works. I mean, I mean, the, we understand now diversity 20 years ago was a buzzword that meant a certain political point of view. Now all political parties want to be seen to be diverse at the top table. But I still think it's quite powerful. Okay, Russ? Well, what I'd like to say is, is that, yes, it is true that that elite uh, has lost a good deal of power, and it's very hard for it to hang on to power, and that is precisely what makes it behave in, in rather dangerous ways from time to time. There is then a special thing, I think, which was the, the World War II and the Cold War were a great opportunity to these people, and they used that to uh, cement and reinforce their power, both in terms of control over national foreign policy, but also 
socially and culturally as well. But you're telling our mem friend, member of the public, uh, that the wasp is winged, but not dead? Yeah. Right. And Russ? Yeah, I don't think that th that, that whole discussion, it, to me, is particularly useful. Um, I don't really care who they, uh, people who are powerful and wealthy, use, whether they get a black person to run for president or more Jews feel comfortable and f particularly as attorneys and Wall Street people feel perfectly happy to join them at the trough. I'm just not that interested in that. Um, uh, since I came here because, uh, because of my book, I'd just like to say this is not a book of theory. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get copies of the book to everybody on the panel, so just you, you should know that. Um, I do have more than a thousand footnotes in here. This is literally a collection of specific facts that I assembled. And just to briefly explain to you some interesting things. Things. George Herbert Walker Bush uh, could not remember where he was on the day that John F. Kennedy was shot. He was 40 years old. He was a Texan. I thought that was strange. I spent two years trying to answer that, and I ended up uh, 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 connecting him to actually being in Dallas that day with a group of people in military intelligence and in the CIA. I actually have their movements in the pilot car of the procession and so on. A very close friend of his who was literally uh, a man named George DeMore and Schild, Godfrey's read about him, was a handler for Lee Harvey Oswald. I mean, these are all mm -hmm. new documented facts. No one has disputed anything about this. Whether it's a WASP elite or not, these are people who don't necessarily feel quite the same way about the democratic system that you and I might. Uh, and they're not very comfortable with presidents like John F. Kennedy who get in there and start doing things that they consider dangerous either to what they perceive as a public interest or to their own interests. I mean, and on that, of course, it's, you, you, you rang the White House to be told there was another George Bush who was working for the CIA at the time. So you have had, you have had denials. But to the general point that, the, that our friend is making, is, are they, are they, is the era of a class of people who are white Anglo-Saxon Protestants is that weakened, or was it never relevant to you in the first place? You know, it, it wasn't that relevant to me in the first place, although I will say this. The, the CIA was created by this group of people. I describe how literally Prescott Bush's business partner, Robert Lovett, created the CIA. I mean, this was a, literally, it was a <coughs> banking firm of Brown Brothers, Harriman. They created this thing. So they were wasps. They're still around. Maybe a few of their children have slipped away and married somebody Jewish or of another color. Uh, they're still around. They don't do it all themselves. And, and as I say, I think it's just bigger than that. Okay. So Actually, you, I'd just like to say I don't think being Catholic or being Jewish or ethnic background is particularly relevant. I think for a very long time, going back to the days of, of Woodrow Wilson, there were Jews, there were Catholics uh, who were accepted in this business elite. And that's more, been more accepted recently, but that's, that's not the central fact. The business of America is business. That's right. So you said the CIA you said business as two of the important powers that shift policy in yeah, the US. And the CIA too, certainly. Right, so, so far, members <coughs> of the audience and me, we've heard the CIA blame them, business blame them, and uh, you're welcome to react. You may shockingly even disagree. Uh, well, look, there's some others. Oh, yes, we're getting there. We haven't finished. <laughs> okay, we haven't finished. Right. We were just trying to get through the start. Now, to you, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Michael Carlson. I'm an American journalist who's uh, been in London for over 30 years. Um, and gave Godfrey's last book a tremendous review in The Spectator, which I was very happy to do. Um, but I, I think the whole ethnic thing is kind of a, a red flag, a, a bullfighter's cape, which is kind of a distraction, because finding Jews within Golden, Goldman Sachs is yeah. not really a huge res revelation. Um, and you can look in the Bush family, if you look at, the, at what the Walker and George Herbert Walker Bush um, comes from, you're back in the investment banking side too. Yeah. But I've got one question and one point to make. The point is, I think Michael made an excellent observation about the Cold War coming to an end and the chaos that has followed and, and nobody is in control. But I would suggest that the whole appearance of terrorists and international terrorists is to create precisely the kind of person, the class of person, that we used to call communist. And it's an effort to reconstitute that kind of framework which allows the people who Russ um, and Godfrey have talked about to function, um, to function normally or efficiently. This is the idea that Michael Moore puts forward that America is governed by fear that one year it's sharks, one year it's smites. Fear, well, fear, yeah, fear works better. And, you know, fear is a better motivator than, so, than so most things. As far as the topic's concerned, you're saying terrorists, but they're not the power behind the throne, but you're saying they're a, they're a good bogeyman exactly. slash woman. Exactly. And my question to Russ is simply, he did a huge amount of research, you know, and there's plenty of, of new stuff, and there's also plenty of stuff 
which he researched that was out there and out there largely, I would say, among people who were discredited by major media. And has he found the same kind of approach from major media to some of the sources that, that he's used and to some of the people who've put ideas out there like his? Uh, well, first of all, there are, there are things in my book that have been out there before. A lot of them were assembled by people who you would consider sort of amateur researchers who came upon documents that were interesting to me. I credit them. I footnote to them. Uh, I think the overall picture is very, very different, however. Uh, in terms of the reaction, there's no question I've been attacked. Uh, the first review, one of the first reviews out of the Pike, uh, a fellow basically uh, began uh, quoting Richard Hofstetter about the paranoid mind, uh, did, ignored the substance in the book. Uh, all of these declassified documents, my actual interviews with uh, five or six hundred sources on the record. He just ignored all of that and said, I'm crazy and I probably think the U.S. didn't land on the moon. So this is the problem. You get attacked by these people. And the man who wrote that, by the way, considers himself a liberal. I found that the people who are most threatened by this actually are liberals. There are people who uh, supported Obama. They're very, very emphatic about their, their greens and this and that and so forth. But they're basically very, very comfortable and they are uh, de facto part of the establishment. And this stuff is so disturbing and so traumatizing, I won't deny it, that it really makes you have to rethink your own life. Yeah, basically. because you're, you're saying it's the system. It's not individuals. Right. And this brings us to you. If I can ask you this, Godfrey Hodgson, do you think in the States it's sort of unpatriotic to question the system, the American dream, and it's better to find a bad guy or even a rogue state. Because if you, if you turn the mirror within the country, that's very hard for Americans, many of whom have died in wars in Europe, uh, to, to answer sort of questions about corruption and rot within the system. I, I do think that it's very hard for Americans to criticize the system. They have been, if you like, socialized or conditioned to believe that it's a much better, a far, far better <coughs> thing. Uh, I, I remember the last time I was on the Today Show in New York, uh, the woman interviewing me uh, said, well, it's all very well, you're very critical of our system, but I mean, I mean, I got to Stanford on a scholarship. You couldn't do that in Europe. <laughs> to which I said, well, until we had a very American-oriented prime minister, uh, everybody went to university <laughs> free. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to let that one settle. It, it, it's a good one. Um, I just want to come back to, to, to Michael's point and, and, and make this one. It's a, it's a bit abstract, but try and wrap your head around it. Um, Al Qaeda didn't need us to create them. I mean, the, at one level we did, yeah, because we armed them. We, we armed the Mujahideen to fight the, the Soviets, and then. Uh, we didn't decommission them, as it were, in, in the way that we decommissioned our World War II battleships and everything when that conflict was over. And possibly we should have decommissioned Osama, but we didn't. Um, the, the, the truth is that terror would have found its way west for other reasons. Um, and once it did, it was perhaps the single biggest gift ever given to the Bush administration. I mean, even more than the Supreme Court handing George W. Bush the presidency, he was floundering immediately, immediately a flounderer, as you could imagine. And then, boom, the World Trade Center is knocked over. And they could, as Michael suggests, I think, reconstitute the global enemy. But the enemy is real. I mean, this is, this is what I'm asking you to wrap your minds around. And I, I sometimes think that it's. It's a continuation of, of, of Edward Said's theories for us to sit here and think, oh, well, this was all created by the, the United States because it needs this to maintain its hegemony. It, it, it's, it seems to me that that's a continuation of Orientalist thinking. In fact, within the Middle East, there's enough grievance and enough worldview and enough mm -hmm. counter reading of their own history to create a, a phenomenon like Al Qaeda or just you know, the whole movement towards a global caliphate, whether the US was supporting Israel or not, whether the US was uh, trying to uh, prop up the Saudi regime or not. Coming to you, coming to you in, the, in the audience in a second, but your, the relevance to this topic is, is it that this keeps a pliant public, that when, whoever's leading it, the people aren't really very... I, I, don't, I don't think that there's any doubt that there is something in, in Gore Vidal's you know, phrase, perpetual war or for perpetual peace, works for the American public for a variety of sad reasons. But just for the theme of tonight, whoever's leading it, if they're a bunch of largely contented consumers, 
They're not going to get in the way with any nasty questions. That's kind of the way it goes, is it? I'm not following your question. Well, whoever's leading the United States, and Darren, tonight the question is, is it not the president, is it a group of other people? Do you need the people to be pliant, whoever's leading? I mean, you, they can't be asking too many awkward questions. Is that the link to terrorism? Because the terrorists aren't running the country, are they? No, 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 but, but, but we're, very quickly we've been conditioned, I say we, I mean people in America have been conditioned in a Pavlovian sense to be so profoundly fearful. I mean every time, I, I did a piece two weeks ago uh, to mark the fifth anniversary of 7-7 and the whole piece was about how there was, no, there was no occasion to mark it at all, no official occasion. Why? Because in this country it is subsumed. I mean it happens. In America, I can assure you that next year on the 10th anniversary, there will be this outpouring and more fear and <clears> more <throat> fear piled on Americans and it will continue to govern the Okay, so, I, no, not now. We're going to the audience. It's a public meeting. You first, you second. So themes tonight, first. blame the CIA, blame business, loyalty to the flag makes a pliant people and the governed by fear. The, you're first at the back. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, try, uh, try and be... Would you say who you are and about, about, yeah. about yourself? Luke Douglas Hume, a freelance journalist. Um, um, tr I'll try not to be too convoluted, but let's just say in very shorthand that your, your basic assertion is that every president, in effect, is a team player. They play the game and they become president. They, the team player, i.e. team of bankers, team of CIA, team of whoever the, the team is, the gang is. Which president do you think, if there has been one, who once in power has changed the game a bit? Great and question. Out of it. Thanks very much. And keep the microphone, and, and you, he's back and forth. Let me start with a different direction. Would you go first on that, Godfrey? Would you single out a president with an independent spirit? Well, I'd single out two. One is Franklin Roosevelt, <coughs> and the other was uh, Lyndon Johnson. They both changed the game in a very serious way. Um, I think there are overlapping circles of power and presidents could be seen as floating on the top of them like ping pong balls on a jet of water or they could be seen as riding them as a man rides a horse, controlling these much stronger powers. And I think both uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Lyndon Johnson were exceptionally good at keeping their balance on these, on these uh, rocking horses. Uh, I wanted to bring up another would you mind keeping it just while I answer this gentleman's question? Yeah, I promise sure. to come back to it. Russ, would you deal with his question? Name a president or two? Yeah, I, I, I think that, that that structure is the wrong way to think about it. Basically, I think that uh, nobody becomes president unless they're already potentially acceptable to these elites. Second of all, I think that uh, uh, when they get in, they're either, I, I think what was distinctive about the Bush family was this is the closest you will ever get to the raw group itself seizing power. Okay, that's what you're looking at. With all these others, they're either people like Gerald Ford who were just apparat chicks for these people uh, or they were people like Jimmy Carter or Bill Clinton uh, who uh, they thought they could handle them and they did to a certain extent or I would say two presidents who who were very very independent surprisingly and this is based only on my research not on what I knew five years ago so right, I'm all right now everyone <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna do my best John F. Kennedy and, paradoxically, the man he defeated in 1960, Richard Nixon, who turns out to have been an entirely different thing, getting into office and then taking on some of the same people who had sponsored him. Okay, and to you, Michael? Um, in, in my life, I probably would agree with, with Godfrey on Lyndon Johnson, despite the, the Vietnam War, where he was. I mean, in fact, you, you can see what happens when a president who really knows what he's talking about and doesn't know what he's talking about is in the room with the guys because he really knew what he was talking about in <clears> terms <throat> of domestic legislation and because he knew that backwards and forwards and he pushed through the most progressive set of laws since Lincoln freed the slaves as we know and then he knew nothing about foreign policy and he was railroaded down the track and by the time he figured out that Vietnam was wrong it was too late and he, he could not stand for a second term. Uh, and relevant to this topic, did he have to fight a lot of vested interests within the US? To I, I have to say, I think the, the US at that point was very, very different. And I don't think that you can, whatever vested interests existed, you have to remember there was a, a popular movement in the street in the 60s that was calling it into question right. uniquely. And I, I, I think he had to be aware of it. And you know, the back, you know, would, the, you, would the, you react? Let the, let the audience react. Would you react to your, your view? Can someone stop? Killing the microphone all the time. We just what, what do you you what, name a president yourself and react to what you've heard? No, I'm, I'm just intrigued intrigued by this question. I uh, keep on being troubled by it. 
I think Reagan, in my, in my lifetime, Reagan was a game changer in his whole dealing with the Cold War issue, but I'm, I may be wrong, but I, I think he was. I think Reagan was a creature of absolutely a kind of business oligarchy which controlled him. Uh, I actually think Reagan was much smarter than he was caricatured in the media as being an idiot. I don't think he was an idiot at all. I spent a year of my life making a series of biopics about him. And, and he's very smart. And he's also a rather pleasant man and so on. But I think he was very much controlled uh, by big money interests. Really. Okay, and bear with me. Coming to you in a minute. I interrupted you at one point. You were going to make another point. It's just a little vignette. Um, there's a moment when Lyndon Johnson is, is coming down the steps of the plane. I was right there. The body of uh, uh, Kennedy is being taken down the back steps of the plane. I am standing next to McGeorge Bundy, who was Kennedy's uh, national security advisor, who I knew slightly. I was talking to him. Johnson comes down the steps. Mac Bundy steps forward and hands him three or four manila folders. Now, at that point, I, I think, I'm, I'm trying to research the details of this, but I think that is the moment at which the foreign policy establishment says, President Johnson, here's what you're supposed to do. I, I, just, I think I saw it happen. Wow. I just want to... to, to well, hold on a second, Rod. We'll just, let's all process that information for a moment. Uh, I interrupted you. Thank you for, for getting to that point. You were there and you saw it. Um, is this it's, rela it's related to exactly what this gentleman said and, when, and what Michael said. The, the, the issue of the domestic versus the foreign policy, I think here's the problem. The people that I'm talking about, the people who primarily uh, fill the pages of Family of Secrets, uh, they don't care about gay rights and they don't care about civil rights and they don't care about civil liberties. They're not interested in any of those issues. These are the issues that bring Americans left and right to attack each other and they love that. You see, this is the brilliant thing, is to get working people all at each other's throats because the issues they care about about, which is primarily the control of natural resources around the world, are a whole different game. LBJ <laughs> was funded and sponsored by literally the same people as George Herbert Walker Bush. And in Family of Secrets, I reveal that, that Bush and Johnson were very close friends. This has never been reported before. Okay. okay. Now, you, you've kindly waited. Would, would you say a bit about yourself? And ask um, my name is Ishmael uh, Blagrove, freelance journalist. Um, the point I'd like to raise is you've spoken about the sort of power behind the throne and its connection to the CIA, big business. Uh, the banking institutions and the likes. Um, but what about the fourth estate? What about the connection of the media and its role in terms of sustaining the status quo? Um, you're all a part of the media. You've been part of it for, for quite some time. And I know my dealings and workings with the BBC have witnessed some sort of questionable practices in terms of how news is reported and whether it's actual fa actually factual. So I'd like to know, uh, my, my question really is, what role does the media play in sustaining the status quo? It's not just the sort of this you know, um, rich, wealthy elite. And um, before, before the panel deal with it, would you give us a clue to what you think? It, it, you've come into the room to see are there powers beyond the presidency. Do you believe that the media is beyond the presidency as a power in the US? Well, I think the media is one, is one of the tentacles as the department such as the CIA or, you know, it's, it's just a part of a, of a, of a broader uh, plan to sustain the sort of status quo, the thoughts of people's minds, the creation of sort of war and turmoil. So it's a powerful, t it's an arm, not an head. For you, it's not a head, it's an arm. Well, I wouldn't know, but, right. um, but at the same time, I do recognise that, that it is a tool and it is used. Um, <coughs> by that entity to well, Please keep the thoughts. microphone, Ishmael, because we'll you can react to what you hear. Would you begin with this? The, you're part of the problem. <laughs> uh, That's a good way to put it. Actually, not anymore. I was, I was laid off five years ago this month, and I'm currently described as self-part-time employed. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's, the media has changed also over the last 30 or 40 years. I don't think you can underestimate the impact that Watergate had on the establishment. Richard Nixon was forced out of office. Um, I, I think Russ has some views as, as to what was really at work there. But I mean, what happened after that was two things. First, um, I think that the powers that be decided the press would never hound another Republican out of office. And so you found it was at this time that very wealthy right wing, I mean, very right wing American people like Richard Mellonscape began supporting all kinds of scurrilous daily newspapers and so on and, and attack machinery. And it was at that time that big money came in and the American Enterprise Institute and the Heritage Foundation were established where fellows, you know, get paid extremely nice money to write 
articles that you know are, are neoconservative fantasies, and they get placed on, on the opinion page of the Washington Post. And I dare say if Catherine Graham was around today, and she's not, and I was interviewing her for the BBC and I'm not, my main question for her would be, did you regret it? Did you not pull back in the way you allowed your newspaper to publish when you saw Richard Nixon get on that helicopter? Because I'm telling you, she did, and I worked. My first job in journalism was at the Washington Post. It had pulled back. Now, there's that side of it. The second side of it is something that Ben Bradley, who's going to be 90 on his next birthday, I think, still says in his after-dinner speeches, for which he's paid lots of money and he's an incredibly amusing fellow, is that water, uh, the Woodward and Bernstein book was the worst thing that ever happened to journalism in America because it made it seem the most glamorous job in the mm -hmm. world. And it's not. Mm -hmm. And so all the wrong kind of people went into journalism. And as things have shaken out, they have built careers. And you have, you know, when I, I always thought that journalism would be, you know, some vast playpen of people from all strata of society. As of now, it is not. It is primarily, you know, even good journalists, the younger ones, the 20s, 30s, and 40s, come from the upper middle class by and large. They're educated very well, and they don't have they don't have it inside of them to ask the questions that you would probably think they should be asking because their curiosity is limited by the class in which they grew up. So I think that there's those two things at work and it is very useful, I think, for you know, the establishment to have this kind of focus on, oh, Obama's, you know, he's, he's passed more domestic legislation in 18 months than anyone since Lyndon Johnson and the whole meme this month has been Obama cannot explain himself. Look at his terrible uh, ratings, which are higher than Ronald Reagan's were after 18 months, because Reagan had caused a recession as soon as he put his economic, pro his first budget through. You know, these things are all tied together. And I, I, I do think that, yes, the mainstream media at the moment in America, I, I, I feel disenfranchised by them, and I'm a journalist. Um, but by the same token, it's not a, I don't think it's a plan. I think it just emerged following these last three or four decades. Okay. Uh, first of all, I mean, I think we're missing something here. Uh, when you're a powerful person, and there are very few of you, and there are lots of the other people, the most important thing you can do is to control the propaganda. There is nothing more important than controlling the message, and that is the media. If you look at the military, if you look at the intelligence agencies, they have huge departments devoted only to figuring out how to keep people in the dark. If you And I've interviewed lots of former CIA and so forth, and they tell me about that, and they say, I love your book because you get really close to what's going on. Now, if we look at the media that most of us work for, these things are for-profit enterprises. They're owned by very, very wealthy people. Uh, if you look at the man who owned the Washington Post, he was a very, very close friend of Alan Dulles, the head of the CIA who was fired uh, by John F. Kennedy. I mean, there are relationships all over the place. In Family of Secrets, I go into the backstory of Bob Woodward. The whole Watergate story uh, mm -hmm. was essentially concocted. And all of these stories we get from time to time about the vigorous press and disputes within the press, it's all uh, fighting within this very, very narrow mm -hmm. realm. But in fact, if you look historically, there never was a great moment of history other than uh, some isolated figures like the columnist Drew Pearson, who really did go after the power elites. It's always been very, very rare that people would take it. And people aren't going to do it for a very simple reason reason we're all terrified we all desperately need to keep our jobs and our paychecks and we all know either because somebody tells us because we know it in our gut that we have to self-censor or we're out of there with two things really one is, one is that the word the media is extremely dangerous word it's the plural of medium and it's another it's a quick way of saying newspapers and magazines and radio and TV and new media but so it is, there isn't something out there called the media it's just a word that's used to describe a number of things secondly those businesses are, as somebody said, <coughs> very large, very prosperous, very conservative corporate businesses. The, the fact that they employ a number of people who are radical, some of them even rather gifted, is neither here nor there. <coughs> the third thing I want to say quickly is there's a wonderful book which uh, describes it. a lot of this very clearly, which is Alan Brinkley's Life of Harry Luce, the founder of, of Time Inc. And it describes the sort of relationships between the powerful publisher with, on the one hand, the, <coughs> the politicians, who he despises. Uh, on the other hand, 
his powerful contacts, including in the intelligence services, especially because they had all been literally members of Skull and Bones at Yale, and then again with his, his reporters and the difficulties he has with the uh, idealistic and radical and difficult ones like Teddy White, who ended up somewhere different. Uh, so uh, that book, I think, describes the, those complex relations very well. Ishmael, would you want to react to what you've heard? Well, I mean, I, I think um, <coughs> I've received a salad rather than the meat that I was looking for. Um, I think a salad rather than what? Rather than the meat that I was looking for. Oh, well, some people are um, vegetarian, remember? Yes, of course, obviously, 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 I'm learning that. But, um, you know, I, I, I do think that you, you, the, 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 you're almost excusing um, the media. I think they've got a lot to answer for. I think the media, the business now, it, it's rotten to the core. I don't, I don't think we have to go back 30 years. I think within our lifetime, then, you know, within the last 10 years, we can see the shift um, whereby institutions have become much more transparent. Let me just ask you a question. Uh, whereby institutions have, have, have um, become much more transparent, like bank banking, big business, and the media itself. Let, let, let me just ask you a quick question. What, do you think that the media, news media actually has that much power in America? Pardon me? Do you think that the news media actually has mm -hmm. that much power in America? The, and let me, mm -hmm. pr let me put in parenthesis, last summer, or last year, close to a billion dollars was spent by lobbyists um, to prevent the passage of some kind of national health legislation. A billion dollars. And you could chart the public opinion that people voted for Obama because he was going to do this. And the more ads they ran, the lower the, his approval rating and the public's desire for doing things. I, I, I'm just asking, do you think that any, any objective news media can fight against a system in which anyone with enough money can run attack ads day in, day out, to create public opinion? Well, first of all, I don't think there's such a thing as objective media. Um, but in, in response to that, if, you, if we look at one particular case, we have the, we have the Chilcot uh, Iraq in, in inquiry here in, here in Britain, and we had, you know, people were waiting for Tony Blair, the star witness, to give his evidence. Tony Blair gives his evidence, and we've got the Sunday, you know, we, the weekend comes by, we, we're expecting the sort of political analysis of and the outcome of what's, um, what Blair said and the, the, part, the, 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 the sort of microscopic look at the detail in terms of what he said, and then the media tells us that John Terry's had an affair and takes us somewhere else. And I'm just saying, saying you know, we have to really look at uh, the, the media's influence in terms of diverting the public's attention away from serious matters. Okay. I, I'd have to agree with you, and also I'd have to say that uh, I mean one of the one of the one of the key issues is that um, uh, they don't tell us how bad things really are. And so he was, you're talking about the lobbying. I mean. It's much worse than people know because they're so determined to be fair with the yes, Mr., yes, Mrs. On the one hand, on the other hand, that's not good reporting because good reporting would be to tell, it would be to call people crooks when they're crooks and explain when they're basically buying the whole system. That is just what everyone on Capitol Hill understands. If you talk to them privately, they'll tell you. And so the gap between what is understood by the people who are there and what the public hears is enormous. And therefore, yeah, I think the media has a tremendous uh, uh, guilt, actually, in, in preventing the public from understanding understanding how bad things really are and that they need to all get involved and do something about it. I, I'm going to move to another question to the audience. On this panel recently, on this platform, there was a discussion making plain that this has been a time of maximum deaths for journalists in recent years and some have even been beheaded on the internet live uh, and in some parts of the world at one occasion 10 were killed at once. So whilst this is a club that wants free discussion, it should be said, I think, from this platform that there's been a lot of death toll for journalism and it's worth reminding you of that, but I'm not seeking to disagree with you. I just think it's my job to say this same uh, organisation uh, tries to highlight the plight of journalists who try to tell the truth. So, but, but being a public meeting, you're welcome to come back at this uh, as an evening progresses, which it will now with you. Uh, would you kindly say something about yourself? Thanks. And off you go. I'm Kevin Bell. I'm happy I'm not a journalist and just a member of the public here. <laughs> uh, I just want to explore how this works in practice. Uh, I think the argument is that both Kennedy and Nixon betrayed the powers that be and the former was killed and the second was deposed. And how did that happen? The cabal met and had a meeting or, I mean, just explain to me how that works. Well, that's why the book is here. There, I brought 24 copies are available, and I'm happy to sign them. And there's uh, 600 pages explaining exactly how those things work. Okay, I'll buy the book. Go for it. Well, I, I, I take the force of that argument, because these things do not work as uh, Th these are not organized armies in which people issue orders so much as, you know, it's the ancient story of Henry II and Thomas a Becket who will 
rid me of this turbulent priest. There is an atmosphere in which it's felt it's time somebody did something about something. And underlings take the crucial decisions, I think. I, I'm, I'm actually not going to say anything on this because I haven't read Russ's book, and I look forward to it. I, I'm very keen, because um, I've long thought that, that Nixon, it just seemed obvious to me that he'd been deposed. The mecha the, you know, a reasonable accounting of the, of the mechanics of that, I haven't seen. And so I'm looking forward to reading Russ's book just to find that out. Um, it was all just a little too pat. And I, I wonder what he did where he wasn't pliant? Was it the opening to China? Did that frighten them? Was it his willingness, um, in the same way that Margaret Thatcher was willing to close grammar schools, he, he, he carried forth the civil rights agenda. All kinds of possibilities here. Plus he did actually do the conspiracy, so that was a gift to them again in the same way that Osama flying planes into the towers. I mean, if, you, if you look you know. at Obama, um, it's, it's a very similar situation. I mean, he, uh, they, they trumpet the fact that he raised m hundreds of millions of dollars on the internet, but he also raised hundreds of millions of dollars from hedge funds. Uh, and uh, we have, by the way, a website called whowhatwhy.com, uh, which you started. It's a nonprofit investigative reporting site. And we're trying to do these stories of the picture behind decision making. So for example, you see uh, Obama uh, golfing uh, last summer on vacation with the head of of UBS Bank uh, of the United States, which had just been fined three quarters of a billion dollars for encouraging Americans to evade taxes, and yet Obama felt it was okay to take this fellow on vacation with him. Um, there are there are absolutely limits on what these people can do. And by the way, you know what what do the intelligence services do? I mean, they have thousands and thousands of people in all sorts of cells who are uh, very compartmentalized, uh, and who, uh, by the way, uh, uh, anybody heard of Mossadegh in? Uh, uh, in Iran or uh, Arbenz in Guatemala or uh, how about Chile or Brazil or shall I go on listing the places where representatives of the U.S. were involved in deposing and killing in many cases uh, elected officials so clearly there is a mindset that this is acceptable to think that that could never happen where the stakes are the highest in our own country seems to me kind of naive. Um, what's your own view? Are you an American? I'm an American, yeah. But uh, I mean, if you've uncovered the assassination of President Kennedy, that's news, I guess. And, and the fact that, Ken, that Nixon is opposed by a right-wing cabal, we know there was the left wing's happening. But I mean, that's interesting. But I mean, the, the, the who killed John Kennedy thing would be big. <laughs> you guys are all journalists. That's big news. I wouldn't mind hearing about that. Okay. Um, well, uh, we, we're going to move, we're going to keep on the topic, uh, and as much as possible, you can, if people want to bring it back to specifics about what's in this book, then that, obviously that will dictate the evening. But it worked, uh, would you like to pick up? Uh, here, the gentleman in the front, and then here at the, here's someone at the back row to go next. Um, I have to say everything is, I'm James Thacker, I'm a writer and I've worked for human rights all my life. Um, it's particularly music to my ears because my father actually represented David Rockefeller in the Gulf, um, that he would have kind of covered the Bush accounts. Uh, every person you've mentioned has been a friend of my family, a branch of my family. I myself have worked in seven human rights groups. My girlfriend worked in Cuba. Um, I've lived my entire life below the minimum wage, so that proves proof positive the wasps are extinct. Um, I, I would like to raise a difficult, very contentious question here. When I asked Steve Rapp, uh, Obama's war crimes prosecutor, about how much influence he was going to bear in Israel, uh, he said, well, look at 85% of the House of Congress representatives voted against the Goldstone Report. Now, I would like to see, you, you mentioned Blankstein, I mean, is it not true that also there is a Jewish elite in America, it's uh, an improvement over the prior elite, that we're moving on, and if you're asking about Obama, I think we have to talk about uh, some of the questions that rose about Rahm Emanuel and Axelrod, people I usually <coughs> admire. Is there not actually a shifting uh, 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 of the whole culture of America in this regard? Michael. Um, let, let, me, let me really think about that and not be glib. I think that, I don't think so, okay? I think that in very specific areas, and, and big areas too, um, entertainment and banking, there is without doubt a, a very strong, strong representation of Jews. And in the entertainment industry, it's not anti-Semitic to say a controlling interest. In the banking industry, be very careful. 
um, because there is a difference between certain kinds of merchant banks and hedge funds where people play casino with your pension, except you don't have one because you've worked below middle, minimum wage your whole life. Um, I, I know the feeling. Um, <laughs> I have to Texas. Yeah, OK. Um, so I'd be very careful about that. I think here's something to think about, because just the way the, the conversation has gone. We say WASP, and, and if we take it literally, then we say, oh, well, it's this group of people. But I mean, uh, look, look at the, um, the, the coalition government that's just been formed here. And you know, th there's a way of thinking. You don't have to be born into the tribe. But if you're educated at a certain school, and if you go to Oxbridge or the Ivy League and Stanford and Duke in America, you will end up necessarily groomed to rise in a certain way. This is what happened with, with Barack Obama. Um, that miraculous jump from Occidental College in Orange County to finish at Columbia, the big move in his life. I, I just would, would back away from that. I think that when I go back to America a couple of times a year, I think you have to understand that in, in terms of the Israel issue, that not just through APAC, although they're very powerful. There is, through the evangelical Christian wing, which is three, four times as large, possibly more than that, than the entire Jewish population of the country, a doctrinaire belief that, that we have to back Israel to the hilt. So you have to look at that as well. I, I'd rather just go on to other questions, frankly, because there's so many things to talk about. Okay. Yeah, I just, this very interesting thing was always interested me, which is the mechanism by which paranoia about, if I can use that word metaphorically, about the Soviet Union uh, became paranoia about uh, Islamism or jihadism. And that is, oddly enough, uh, a paper written by Paul Wolfowitz. And it's interesting, not because he happens to be Jewish. What's interesting is he was then working for the Carter administration. And he wrote a paper, he was asked to write a paper, he was a, a deputy assistant secretary or something. What are the possible new threats that could arise? So he writes a paper which says, watch out, what if? Uh, and he, that's the first time where you see the whole sort of people who supported Team B, the people who were hardliners and hawks on the Soviet Union, suddenly shifting across and becoming hardliners and hawks on Islam. But uh, can I ask you then, since we're all here for this central question about the forces behind the presidency, is religion one of them? Is this what's behind your question? Whether it's Judaism, whether it's Christianity, no one ever says Muslims and Islams are very powerful in the United States. I, I don't know that anyone says that, but they do say that Christianity and Jews, Ju Judaism is. But I haven't yet heard anyone say I, that. Listen, this whole thing is a red herring. I mean, for every well, would Jew... would you address it to the gentleman sure, who raised Sure, sure. For every Jew who's a wolf for it, there's somebody uh, who's involved uh, with supporting uh, Gaza or complaining about the Israeli government. If you go to Israel, there, there are demonstrations. There are people in the military who won't serve. The United States is full of uh, lefty Jews who disagree. Uh, there just simply is no organized conspiracy. There are certainly Jews who are part of that establishment. Okay, can you, would you like to reply? Yeah. Hey, that. use the microphone. I, I, I said that Obama represents something completely new in the history of the Republic, which is an international leader, a multiracial leader. He speaks to all of America as no leader ever has before. Therefore, uh, the Republican Party has been basically KO'd by this situation. And the kind of conspiracy you're talking about, which is a racist conspiracy, I don't think exists anymore, actually. It can't exist in this environment. We could never have such a president again. We could never have Bushes again. Well, I'm not talking about any kind of a racist conspiracy at all. I'm talking about people uh, who generally uh, who have old money and who were very used to having a position and were interested in retaining it. That's the way it works in most societies. And I can tell you, I've just come from tr uh, touring on the continent, and everybody says to me, I don't know why you Americans are so surprised by this. We understand this in Germany, in Switzerland, in Italy, and so on. They said, we have the same stuff going on here, that there are powerful people who have money, and, and, and they want to keep it. And, and that's what we're talking so about. So it's powerist. Well, I mean, if I think of David You have to use the microphone. I'm going to go over here. I'm sorry. I mean, the, the, the extremity of David Rockefeller going as soon as Reagan was elected down to um, Argentina and telling the colonels at the height of the desaparecidos to get on with it because America backed what they were doing, we couldn't have such a presidency again. And that's what Bush represented. I mean, this was very extreme, quite fascistic, quite scary. And we can't have that kind of presidency again, I would say. I think the whole, there's a multiracialism in America which has never been there before. And can I ask you, do you believe that religion and religious influences are one of the powers 
behind the presidency in the United States. You don't, you, you, can you tell me yes or no? Uh, I wouldn't say that, no. actually. No, okay. I wouldn't say well, that. Well, we've got, would you have the microphone next over here. Yes? Um, yeah, hi. My name's Stephen Graham, a journalist. Um, Paddy, you're, you're quite keen to sort of, um, you know, squeeze the discussion, but, you know, you started off with Russ here, Baker, saying, you know, coming up with a pretty extreme statement, saying, that, you know, that, uh, if I got it right, that, that uh, George Bush Sr. was a deep cover agent for the CIA, and I kind of feel that we're all going to go away thinking this is all a bit crazy, and this... I don't know why you would when I brought the book with all the documents. Well, you know, I just you spell it out. And no, I, I but it goes to a deep, deeper point there. Is you, you know, you're saying, you know, much of the discussion just boils down to uh, money buys power. And I'm like, well, hey, what? You know, that's, we kind of know that. So in what, in what, but this is something a, a bit more extreme where you're, you're suggesting that there's actually someone, that there are forces which control uh, those at the top as their agent, which is a much more extreme allegation. And I wonder, you know, to what extent the, the other two also kind of feel that kind of thing is possible, or is it just boiled down to the simple point, which is, you know, rich people have more influence than people who don't have so much yeah. money. So I think he's speaking up for you, which is that in seeking to do broad themes, I'm not letting you list some of the work you've done. And uh, the I book... Know, is it, you know, why should we not think that's a kind of yeah, utterly would, crazy Yeah, would you thing? like to, to say the sort of research you did, and would the others, would you like to address, are you saying anything new than money buys influence? Uh, so you go first, and sure. then you can react. Uh, Keep well, the mic. Uh, uh, okay, so, so basically, I mean, again, I want to emphasize my work is, I'm not trying to argue some theory here. I came at this thing, uh, tabula rasa, I just started assembling documents. So, for example, I discovered that in 1953, George H.W. Bush created a little, small, obscure oil company in West Texas that nobody ever heard of, nobody ever heard of him either, and yet the owner of the Washington Post gave him fifty thousand dollars. That what, head of the Washington Post was the closest friend of Alan Dulles, who ran the CIA. I have a letter where they talk about our Caribbean project, and then they put a rig. This company never made any money off of Cuba. The company was co-founded with a man named Thomas Devine, who I found what had been an active duty CIA officer who quote unquote resigned to go into the oil business with Mr. Bush. I called Mr. Devine, who is still alive in New York City, and I said, I have these documents, and he said, Am I authorized? to talk to you and I said well by who and he said well have you has this been cleared by the you know by the Bush family and I said I have these documents. You were in the CIA. You started this company. I just want to know what the story is. And he said, I don't think I can talk to you. And then I told him, I have these other documents showing you doing this and this and this. And he said, I really have to just leave it at that. Now, you can conclude what you want about this, but when you interview hundreds of people like that and not a single one of them tell you that what you have is wrong, you have to assume that there's something there. You know, people talk about conspiracy theory. I'd have to la label this whole thing of people who dismiss everything, uh, no matter how much evidence there is, as coincidence theory. So, so just to reassure him, although we've only got tight time, the claims you make are based on face-to-face -face or telephone interviews over the course of five years. So in, his question is, what are you saying this on? You would say, answer the following five. And, and documents and also material I assembled from hundreds of other books that did a great job but are not well known. Somebody said, well, this would be big news. The fact of the matter is this will never be big news because I can tell you from my personal experiences throughout my career, I would do a story for, I will not say what it is, one of the top newspapers in America on something about MK Ultra with uh, uh, the uh, CIA and its efforts to uh, use LSD on unsuspecting individuals. Uh, uh, that was for this major newspaper. When I turned it in, they were afraid to run it, and it ended up running as a, I believe it was a cover story, in The Observer uh, here in London. That's just the way that these things happen. One of the points that you've both raised by your question is that you imply there's a revolving door, that people go into active service in the CIA, and then they come <coughs> out of it and go into business. Well, we know that they, the, 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 these agencies, and it's the same thing with MI6, they have hundreds or thousands, they are not out there openly giving people money and running offices that say MI6 Belgrade branch or whatever it is. I mean, they have cover everywhere. They have all of these companies. They're companies inside legitimate companies. They're fake companies. I, throughout my career, have interviewed dozens of people whose own companies were actually taken over against their will, and they were told there's going to be a parallel company using your name and doing exactly what you do, and some of them even got stuck with the bills at the end. <laughs> Since we knew that uh, George Bush Sr. ran the CIA, um, the, you knew that. Did you think that he just, he might have been connected with them before? And if he, if Russ had evidence for you, would be interested in reading that. If the ev if it was denied officially that he had, would that, would you think there was a story there which you'd want to see the evidence of? And what's your view on this question that you asked about George W. Bush and the CIA, a former director of it? Well, I, mean, I think I'm, I'm quite skeptical of what, what you're saying, but I, that's my job to be skeptical. So, yeah. you know, 
I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to reading what evidence you have. Um, the, the, I mean, the fact that people have connections to, to each other is, is, as we've seen in the war on terror, not a reason for assuming guilt. Yeah. And I, I, well, I, I, I actually, I actually, I actually myself spent a lot of time looking through the National Archives, uh, looking into, uh, uh, in, of the US, the, the Prescott Bush, and, and I mean, it didn't anything like the research you've obviously done, but just looking at one specific story uh, regarding his uh, profits made during the Second World War. Um, and what was interesting to me was you saw a lot of people connected together. Um, but for me, just having a lot of people together on the same photograph well, it's the same not room doesn't, doesn't lead to conclusions. No, but it's of, not of a matter guilt. of anything yeah. like that at all. I'm talking about a declassified CIA, uh, FBI document from J. Edgar Hoover dated November 23, 1963, and it says at the request of the State Department, uh, we, conducted, uh, uh, we, uh, we conducted some con uh, uh, co uh, conference regarding CIA, there was headline, Assassination of President John F. Kennedy. It was by J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, and it said, mm. we held uh, a conference with a two members of other intelligence agencies, Mr. William Edwards of the Defense Intelligence Agency and Mr. George Bush of the CIA. Now, they tried to pin this on another man who, it turns out, was hired by the CIA. He was not even in the intelligence business. They hired him shortly before the assassination of Kennedy on a trial basis, and then they got rid of him shortly after the assassination. They later, when, when Bush was running for president and this document came to light, they actually, they never admit or deny that the people worked for them. They actually came out and said, oh, it was this other guy, but we don't know whatever happened to him. Okay. They found this man, and he testified in court that it was not him in that document. He'd only been hired for the short period, and he never had the authority to be involved in any kind of uh, briefings at all. So let me just say that I, I've read this relevant chapter, so the point that Russ is making is he's never, he's never accused George Sr. of being involved. He says he knew he was in briefed by the CIA because there was a document he got his hands on saying George Bush. Subsequently, he rang the White House to be told it was another George Bush. And then one of the themes of Russ's book is that there are people with similar names who crop up throughout the work of the security services. God forbid you and me are involved, someone else comes along has a mysteriously the same name. And that's part of the tenets of his book, to answer a, a point that you earlier raised, but not to make it clear, he's never accused George W. of having anything to do with it. He said he was briefed on it. So, uh, Godfrey, you wanted to come back, and then uh, we have, we've only got about 15 minutes left. Right, uh, uh, real quickly, it reminds me of the, uh, 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 real quickly, and then a, more, a point of more substance. Reminds me of the <coughs> useful fellow in Boston politics who was called John F. The name's the same Kennedy, and they were always running him for things and blaming him for things. <laughs> uh, this very useful thing. Uh, the point I, I would like to make to Stephen. I mean, Stephen expresses just the kind of skepticism that I have. I find it hard to believe some of the direct uh, consequences. I just don't think we're in a world of of people flicking on switches and lights coming on. I think that what I do like about this book is it, it yeah, uh, my feeling is yes, that's the way it is. And I was there a lot of the time. I've known a lot of these people. And they are, the way it works is they call each other up or they have a quiet word after a meeting or they have a discussion over a dinner table and suddenly the thing to believe has become slightly different. And I think that is one of the hardest things for a historian to, to get at, these kind of very wispy cultural connections. To you second. Um, you've got um, the microphone now. I do, thanks. Uh, my name is Fraser. I'm just an interested observer. And uh, sorry to hark back to question for five minutes ago, but I, I couldn't let it go without saying something. I couldn't disagree more with what you said about the dismissal of religion in American politics. Since Reagan, you know, went crazy with religion in the early 80s, it's been a massive issue. And I strongly believe that a lot of the issues you have in the world just now is because it's ruled by a Judeo-Christian white, you know, governance. And the problem is that we cannot see the other side of the coin. Our governments can't, our public can't. We've got no idea what the world looks like from a brown Arabic um, side of the coin, and that's the problem. If you think that religion doesn't play a, a, a major role in American politics, I think you're in cloud cuckoo land, because an atheist would never get in. I mean, Obama is probably the most rational presidential candidate and president has been for many, many years, and even he had to stand up in front of APAC in his, uh, in his uh, campaign and say he defended the right of United uh, Jerusalem for the capital, and that he doesn't even believe it. 
Well, I actually do think that religion plays a role, and I have an entire chapter in Family of Secrets about how George Bush, George W. Bush, as opposed to H.W., pretended to be born-again Christian, and I actually interviewed the man who wrote the memos to the family on the importance of doing this. He actually coached father and son, and he told them that the religious right in this country has become so big and so powerful, a voting bloc, you simply cannot be elected without it. Jimmy Carter was elected as a Democrat with it. Ronald Reagan was elected as a Republican. Ronald Reagan also faked uh, the, 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 you know, the Jesus card. And, and, and according to these people and these memos, so did George W. Bush. So I do think religion plays a role. I just think that what I'm focusing on here is something else. Okay, but then you did from this panel imply something else, which is what Fraser's picking up on. Was one of the forces in play within the American political rel system religion? And you, you told me no. No, there are lots of different forces that are in play, but I'm, I'm just saying that this particular analysis of why presidents are captive, Democrat, Republican, year after year, has has to do with facts that the, the banking firm of Brown Brothers and Harriman literally, okay. people don't know if they had the, I want to finish because he's been able to talk at great length and I came from New York so I'd like to be able to talk a little bit. <laughs> also, I'd, I'd like to hear some women ask some things too, by the way. Yeah. Well, um, do you have a magic wand? You're, you're keeping one back who's trying to answer at the moment, so I mean, okay, it's okay, up to you. I just want to finish the point. So, so anyway, the fact of the matter is this, this banking firm of Brown Brothers Harriman, uh, their, their partners were advisors to American presidents, uh, FDR, Truman, Eisenhower, Nixon, uh, Bush, Bush, and on and on. And that's interesting to me, that the same small firm had people in every White House, irrespective of what party they're in. Sorry. Um, hold on, I'm going, to, I'm going to interrupt you. Fraser, do you still think this is, you've come into this room, in your opinion, is religion one of the forces behind the US presidency? I think, I think it's the major force, and it leads to global double standards. There's one standard for Judeo-Christian whites, and there's another standard for, for brown Arabics. And the difference, the delta between these two, these two standards, is the driving force behind the problems we have just now. Just quickly to respond to, you, to that specific point, Fraser. I mean, early, early on, did you hear me talk about Edward Said? Sorry, no, I missed the first 20 minutes, sorry. Well, don't be sorry. You're you okay, I'm not going to repeat it. But I, I'd just like to, to take up your point, uh, uh, take up Russ's point. I'm sorry to grab your time, man. Um, look, the religious right, as it's come to be known, were, were you, those of us who, who studied Marxism and, and Leninism will know, were used as useful idiots, I think, in the early days of, of Reaganism. Then they took on a power of their own. And I think that one of the very large problems facing the Republican Party now is that they're so powerful at the grassroots that the Republican Party, which probably wishes it hadn't created this monster, now has to pay, pay homage to it in almost everything it does. And I think that, that to that extent, um, religion is a very powerful, powerful force in the day to day. Hello, uh, my name is Malia, I'm a French member of the public. I was just wondering, um, do you think such a hidden power could sustain itself without actually getting some help from other countries, especially since such a long time? I know it's out of the scope of the subject, but I think that narrowing the subject of hidden governance strictly to US, always putting the blame on US, will not help the chaos that you were talking about, the worldwide chaos. Because it's just not logic to think that one country can do it all by itself. Especially for the media, all the sources are intertwined. Same for the CIA. Don't you think it gets some help from other intelligence institutions? And again, like you were talking about religions, I'm asking you, do you know if, like for example, there's some meetings sometimes of all religi religious leaders? Uh, well, f first of all, let me just say that, I mean, I think nationalism is for saps. Um, you know, the, the, the poor people are the ones who send their children to die in the wars. It's not the rich people. We, we see this with George W. Bush. Uh, the fact of the matter is that for rich people, they've always intermarried. I mean, look at the British royal family intermarried with the Tsar's family and the, and the <coughs> Kaiser's family. I mean, they never cared about that stuff. These guys were doing banking deals, uh, you know, in Russia uh, with the, with the, when the Tsar was in power, and they were perfectly happy to deal with the Bolsheviks. They don't care about any of that stuff. We're the ones 
ones who are left to talk about how other countries are somehow threatening to each of us. Uh, so, so yes, absolutely, I think it's an international phenomenon. I think figures like Berlusconi, uh, your leadership in France, I mean, these guys are all in cahoots. Uh, they're all working with very big companies. You just have to look at uh, BP, uh, uh, huge blocks of those shares, which are owned by the sovereign wealth funds of all these other con uh, countries, major blocks of shares in the United States. It's all mixed together. And by the way, in Family of Secrets, near the end of the book, I have a section on, on the backstory of the relationship between George Bush and Tony Blair, which hasn't been reported before. And it's through an old school chum of Blair's who's in the oil business, and it connects back to BP as well. And my name's Martin. Can I just clarify something that somebody asked earlier um, about, is it just uh, money and influence and power, or are people in, like a, a president, um, not an agent in an intelligent sense, but a, um, a, you know, somebody tells them what to do, so they, they hand in some documents at the bottom of a, some plain steps. Can, I, can we throw this microphone away? Can you say it all again on this one? Okay, just let's pretend that one never existed. Start again. Sorry. Again. My name is Martin. Um, just to clarify a question from before um, about uh, power, influence, and money. Yeah, that's nothing new. Or what? To what extent does uh, Russell, as a, a panelist, think that um, a president is um, sort of controlled? Not an, not an agent in an intelligence agency sense, but uh, somebody who's handed some documents uh, at the bottom of the plain steps. Um, yeah. That, that, Somebody not takes quite advice. Conspiracy, but yeah, advice. Yeah, well, the difference between influence, advice, and who's the top guy? You mentioned the, the guy with the hat, and you can tell who's in control. Like you know, the Panama hats and, and the photo. Godfrey, do you want to start, and then we'll go back down this <coughs> way? Yes, I think this is the the most difficult question for historians: the the relationship between individuals who do have a certain freedom of action, and yet who respond to forces that are stronger than them. Uh, but I think that politicians everywhere, and certainly politicians in Washington, have a very acute sense of who you must not upset on, and of what uh, issues it would be dangerous to take up. And I think that, that the, the, the process of how those no-nos and those yes-yeses are defined is the thing you want to look at. And I think that in the United States, there has been a, a moneyed aristocracy, if you like, an establishment, uh, which has defined what you can say and what you can't say. I mean, for years, I remember <coughs> listening to, as a, as a British journalist, you know, listening to people pontificating about the Cold War and the, uh, systematically exaggerating the strength and power of the Soviet Union as an excuse for demanding more defense expenditure, uh, more hardware. Um, it's very hard to get at. You, it's very easy to do conspiracy theory about, oh, yes, they all go to the Bielerberg conference, uh, conference or the Ditchley conference, and somehow the deals are being stitched up there. It isn't as crude as that. And yet, there are ideas which are uh, excluded and there are facts which are concealed. And as a result, decisions are taken which are in people's partial interests. Uh, let, let me give you a recent example. Are, are you all familiar with uh, General Stanley McChrystal, uh, who was recently removed by Obama? Uh, long ago, uh, they were leaking uh, when Obama had not decided what to do about Afghanistan. And remember, who is Obama? This is a man who had no experience with any of these things, is suddenly thrust into the most powerful position in the world. Who actually bothers to ask who this man really is, how he got to the top, who wanted him? And we just skip that whole thing. Rah, rah, we're thrilled. It's a black man. It's this and that. No, no, he's a dangerous socialist. I mean, it's all nonsense. But in any case, uh, look at McChrystal. So here's this man, and they leak this report saying that the U.S. basically has to uh, increase the troop strength in Afghanistan, and Obama's hand is forced, and so he agrees to uh, 20,000, 20-some 20 thousand additional troops. Um, 
And then later, by the way, if you read this very interesting Rolling Stone article where McChrystal, this is what caused McChrystal to be fired, one of the things he says in there, which I find very, very interesting, he says is that when the decision was made that he was going to take over the situation in Afghanistan, he was ushered in with Obama, and he was appalled to see that Obama barely knew who he was and was not well informed about that. Well, if the president is taking this man in to, uh, to manage this incredibly important battle situation there and doesn't know who this man is, then obviously somebody else made the decision that McChrystal goes in. And that's the kind of thing that I'm interested in. And uh, Michael? Yeah, uh, let me just come back to, to your question and, and pick up on, on Godfrey and, and maybe, maybe um, try and find an answer here as well. I think Godfrey points to something around the table, people of like mind. Just after the uh, coalition was formed, I wrote a piece for Global Post, noting that the real danger is this. Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, Clegg went, went to Westminster and, and Cambridge and, and, and uh, Cameron went to Eton and, and Oxford. Okay, they might have some social friends in common. Osborne is Westminster and Oxford, blah, 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 all of that stuff. What happens is, when they sat around doing the negotiation, even if they didn't know each other, they knew each other. They could have said, did you know so-and-so? Just over coffee while they were trying to hammer out the break. Yeah, I did. Well, he was my teacher too. And one thing and another, and there's a comfort zone. And then, the next thing you know is you have an agreement, and the next thing you know is you have the budget. Now, this is what happened to Lyndon Johnson, and to, and to a certain degree John Kennedy, but he was fighting his way clear of it, then he got shot. He, he put together a group called, famously, the best and brightest. They were all chaps of a certain age, of a certain education, of a certain war experience. There was no other voice at that table, and consequently, once they, they put the ship out to sea, that's where American policy went for a decade. One of the good arguments for diversity, which gets forgotten now that it's become a demonized word, is that when you bring people in from 15 different social classes and get them around the table, then a lot of what you think is, well, we all think this, isn't possible anymore, and you come up with different solutions. And I think that in, uh, in understanding the way America works, and in fact, I can just imagine a scenario, and I'll, I'll look for Russ's article explaining precisely how McChrystal got appointed. I can see that, the, he, you know, it's a big job, President, even if you have no real power. Um, you know, the, uh, what are all these papers? And someone comes up to him who says, well, I had dinner with Petraeus the other day. Say Petraeus. Or say someone else at, at the Pentagon. And he says McChrystal's actually the real deal. Well, I want Petraeus to be running CENCOM, says Obama. That's decided. Okay, well, McChrystal has the respect of the troops. Bingo, that is all that goes into the decision. That's right. And McChrystal is there, and, and with uh, what happens, and I'm waiting for the thorough yeah. report. Okay, but let me, here's the thorough report. More than half of the disposable dollars in the U.S. budget goes to war, okay? War is the single biggest industry in the United States, and without war, our economy simply collapses. This is the elephant in the room. We journalists act like this just doesn't exist. And so all of this stuff is this kind of stuff. A guy comes in and had dinner with someone, so that's nonsense. I mean, the fact of the matter is almost every major company in America, and by the way, all your big British companies, they all live off of war. The companies that make buses and bus shelters and this and that and shoes and whatever, their biggest clients are almost always the military. It's this huge and never-ending gift that keeps on giving. And we don't talk about this. We in the media should be covering this issue on a daily basis. This is as important uh, as the oil gusher uh, in the Gulf is. It's, this is this is a cash gusher and a gusher of lives, and we don't talk about this stuff. There are all these people, and let me tell you something, just as we're sitting here, believe it or not, there are other people in the world, and they may be all sitting at somebody's house near where you were born, on the main line of P Pennsylvania, having dinner together and smoking cigars, and they're not exactly having the same conversation we're having. They think that the people trying to do something about climate change are an annoyance to them and what can they do to stop those people? How can they vilify those people? How do we get the word out and get the public to think that they're right, not the other guys? This is the way it really works. They talk about stuff. Well, I just want to tell you one quick story. Uh, uh, one uh, journalist, a very well-known, well-respected magazine journalist, after reading my book said, you know, uh, around the Watergate era, I was invited in to have dinner at the Senate with one of the two or three most powerful Republicans. Uh, 
he called me and he said, your work is very, very interesting, looking into whether there was something else about Watergate. And he said, do you ever notice how the, we know who the CIA director is? And, and we don't know who the directors at that time are, MI6 and the Mossad and the Italian intelligence and the French intelligence. He said, do you ever wonder why that is? And the guy said, yeah, I did. He said, why is that? He said, well, do you ever wonder if the head of the CIA is really the head of the CIA? And then he just kind of let that sink in with him. And he said, why do you think that would be, that these people would be there for a year and then leave, that a George Herbert Walker Bush would be in there for a year, a complete doofus who couldn't even and complete a sentence, and yet they named the CIA building after him. I mean, the, the notion that powerful people simply uh, want to go in and overthrow people as is, uh, they've all admitted in all of these other countries, but in our own countries, they simply want us to decide everything. I mean, it's just ludicrous. It's really ludicrous that these people don't do anything. And um, just in our final closing minutes, if you want to, to have a closing thought over here to the uh, to the cyber the working microphone, can I also ask to elicit views from anyone in the room who disagrees? Uh, in other words, that there is a power behind the presidency, and it's the people, and that the U.S. system uh, the U.S. system encourages people to to vote in primaries, encourages shareholders to kick out bonkers business people, uh, and if there's anyone who wants to put a sort of old-fashioned view about trust the people, uh, you should do that before the room closes. And on the grounds of the presidency, you know, obviously in Europe uh, there's been some great examples of, the, of generosity from the United States, the Marshall Plan, uh, the contribution of US troops in the w wars against fascism. So what powers were they uh, there? No one's, uh, no one's said if it's always bad for our interests, for instance. But time is tight now, so uh, those are questions for you. But uh, over here in the corner, I hope you've got a working one. Please uh, bring us to, to sort of a conclusion. Well, I think I, I have got a working one. Thank God for that. Um, <laughs> and the microphone? Yeah. <laughs> um, just the microphone, I think. <laughs> uh, my name is Mick Smith, and I apologise for being part of the mass media. Um, I was very struck by the, when the question was asked about the presidents and named two presidents. And um, I very struck, as most people would have been, by Michael Moore's film where you see George W. Bush being told about 9-11 and, and you know, he sat on that primary school chair. And um, the similarities with a president trying to deal with a major ecological disaster and changing horses in midstream in Afghanistan when, you know, I, I'm sorry, I thought we were trying to sort the country out. Um, if we're not, let's get out. Um, is it possible for any politician, and this is a question for all three of you actually, to come out of Chicago and be clean. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a no Henry ending. Um, well, do you want to start, Michael? Oh God, it, uh, all I'd be doing is re-frying re cliches. Um, <coughs> I'd like to deal with uh, Barack Obama as as he seems, since he doesn't have that much of a backstory in public, right? He seems to have managed to twist the necessary elbows to rise very quickly from small local positions to the state senate, to the senate, to the White House in what, six years? Um, I'd like to think that in his case, he used the power at his disposal um, in the same way that the, the once great wasp aristocracy, still great in some places, um, uses its power. People use what, what power they can. His power, I think, it goes without saying, was in the fact that he, he was an African American and he was exceptionally articulate. And I think that his liberalism, which is quite centrist and always has been, he never seemed flaming, except, you know, if you think voting against going to war in Iraq is, you know, flaming liberalism, he did it. Um, but by and large, he's a centrist. So I think it isn't a question of him being uh, washed in the impurities of, of Chicago life as, as we know it from David Mamet. I'd like to take him as he is and try and see him as he is, which is, of course, very difficult because you know, the Washington Press Corps tends to paint him as they would like him to be painted. Well, if you change uh, Chicago to Illinois, I, I fire Abraham Lincoln at you. It is possible for good things to come out of Illinois, whether you approve of Ronald Reagan or not. 
I do think that one of the things I rather like about Obama is that he has got the basic political skills to have survived in that, uh, that somewhat turbid waters of, of Chicago politics. I like my progressives to be competent. I like them to be Lyndon Johnson or Franklin Roosevelt. I do not particularly admire incompetent or weak progressives. Russ? Yeah. I really have no idea uh, who he is, what deals he made. I read a lot of stuff during the campaign. I was appalled at the bad journalism. I'm appalled at all these best-selling books. I won't say who they're by, famous uh, editors and so forth, about Obama and his path. All So little journalism, so little digging in any of it. So I'm going to withhold judgment because I don't like to make predictions and I don't like to be wrong. Um, I will say that uh, it is... I think all manner of people do get to the top for a lot of different reasons. I think there's a lot of jostling visibly and otherwise it always goes on. I don't think it's a set formula and I think it's entirely possible that he is a decent guy. He's certainly uh, uh, competent and articulate, trying to do what he can do, uh, probably overwhelmed, probably didn't know all of these things because he was so incredibly ambitious all the time. He was driven by that. He never had a strong articulated set of positions on anything. In fact, if you study him carefully, he reversed himself throughout his career on lots of different things. So I, I think he was principally driven uh, by ambition and also I think by the notion that if he could become president uh, uh, as, as a black man, that would be a contribution. So, you know, I guess I'd have to say that despite the sort of revelations I have in Family of Secrets, I, I am basically an optimist and I think that if we get good information out, uh, it's still possible to influence these situations and, and to have some kind of hope that uh, that, that not everything's going straight down the tubes. Okay, um, I, I, it's 8.30 and I propose in all the panels that I'm uh, lucky to sit on to run, start them on time and end them on time. So uh, tonight we heard from a man who spent five years writing a book who would encourage you to know that he has sources. Uh, I, we've also heard from a man who was there uh, at the foot of the plane and saw LBJ receive Manila documents and still wants to know what's in them. Uh, and we heard from a man who became a British citizen uh, for, for reasons he hasn't explained tonight. Uh, and from you, thank you for your contributions, asking for the name of presidents, uh, criticising the media, asking for rigour, pointing up religion. I've been, uh, thank you very much indeed for coming, but especially to our panel, Russ Baker, Michael Goldfarb and uh, Godfrey Hodgson. Thank you very much.